Hi there. It's uh, hi. It's Wednesday. It's time for lunch with Luke today. I don't think it's going to be a very long time, but I'm very excited to look at the birth of John the Baptist. We'll be covering Luke 1, uh, verse 57 through 80. So I'm glad that you're here with me or that you're glad for you if you're watching this at a different time. I have, just so that you know, I have posted these onto YouTube now so that if you have friends who aren't on Facebook and you want to share um, lunch with Luke with them, you can um, point them to my YouTube page. And um, I'll try to remember to put a YouTube uh, link onto my Facebook page sometime later today. All right, I'm going to just pray and launch into Lunch with Luke. Father God, today we want to look at the birth of John the Baptist and uh, Zechariah's uh, moment when he is able to speak again. We want to think about the announcement of redemption for our humanity because it is a powerful truth that we need to hold on to, especially in these times. We need to know, Lord, that um, that you are not going to lose patience with us, that in fact that you have provided a way for us to be redeemed. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so today I want to look at John the Baptist. Last week we talked about um, how we can see Joel, uh, Joel chapter 2, being lived out in this visiting of the Holy Spirit on Elizabeth and on Mary and Mary's Magnificat and that, um, you know, Joel says that in the in these days, my spirit will be poured out on all flesh and young women will, you know, young men will dream dreams and young women will see, have, old men will have visions and Holy Spirit will be poured out on all flesh. And so we see that, right? Because Elizabeth, is speaking prompted by she's filled with the holy spirit uh, the, gabriel announced that john the baptist would be filled with the holy spirit from the womb which wow okay and then mary is inspired by the holy spirit with her magnificat and she's this young woman speaks this incredible pronouncement of not just joy and exuberance at the Lord and the blessing that he's shown on her in her humble estate. But she also talks about the toppling of thrones and that the rich are going to be sent away empty and the hungry will be filled with good things. So it's a sort of revolutionary uh, tone that she has as a humble young woman in Israel oppressed by Rome. She suddenly has this bold confidence by the Holy Spirit. So it's powerful, and the fact that Zechariah during this time has been silenced because of his moment of unbelief means that he was probably just put in a place where he just was taking it all in. You know, maybe he was even told about uh, Joseph having a dream that it would be fine with it, it, that he should be fine staying betrothed to Mary, that the child she was with was with the Holy Spirit. So. Zechariah is actually watching everything that he's longed for come to fruition in front of his face, and he's not able to speak yet. He's he's had to be silent because of that moment of unbelief. And we've talked about, and I wrote about on my blog, if you go there, that even as believers, we can allow unbelief to creep into our hearts. It it's creeps in silently from all kinds of circumstances. And we need to be diligent about bringing that unbelief, those little nibbles of unbelief that start, that we bring those to light so that they can be healed and addressed and that we can, um, that God can help us with our unbelief. But now in uh, verse 57, we read, now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth and she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy on her and they rejoiced with her. So this is great. And they recognize this as God's mercy. And you'll see in Luke 1, God's mercy comes up again and again, which is just incredible. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. And they would have called him Zechariah after his father. So even when we see God moving, we still try to shape it. We still try to fit it into what we already know, right? So God, here God is doing a new thing something that's been predicted from of old, and yet it's a new thing. And, and the humans are, even the ones that are accepting of God moving, are trying to shape it. And, that, and we do that. We try to say, okay, so, all right, so this is happening. How do we fit it into our, what we already know? How do we put it into our box, into our current tradition? And 
And God's just saying, you know, sometimes I'm just blowing it all away. Sometimes I am just moving in a direction and you've just got to um, hang on and go with what I'm doing. And Elizabeth is in that mode. Elizabeth's like, no. So she says, um, but her, his mother answered, no, he will be called John. And they said to her, none of your relatives is called by this name. Because that's, you know, that's, they know, this is how this goes. This is how this goes. This is Zechariah, his name means God is remembered. This is his own, you know, definitely going to be his only child. This is, we didn't even expect this one. It's a boy. We've definitely got to name him Zechariah. This is how this works. And she says, no, his name is John, which means God is gracious. But she's a woman. No, never mind that she's a miraculous woman giving birth to a miraculous child. They, they, they make signs to Zechariah. They make signs to his father inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And Zechariah asked for a writing tablet and he writes, his name is John. And they all wondered, like, why call this child John? But immediately his mouth is open and his tongue loosed and he spoke, blessing God. And fear came on all their neighbors, and all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea, and all who heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. So here, Zechariah, we can see that now this belief is restored. He wasn't lost in this unbelief. This was, there are people who completely shut out God, who choose their sin, who choose, who reject Jesus Christ. And, and their unbelief stands against them. As Christians, though, as those who are bent toward God, as those who have chosen to follow him, there we can have moments where unbelief creeps in. And yet that doesn't mean that we're condemned or lost. We are in Jesus Christ. Zechariah is an example of this, having received back this faith. So received it through this silence and watching, he is restored. It's interesting to me uh, this is just like a side thing, but again, it says fear came on all their neighbors. We have heard about fear coming on people through this whole chapter, right? Which is kind of the difference. I didn't know if you grew up watching the show um, Touched by an Angel, right? Whenever anybody on that show had an encounter with an angel, they felt peace and calm and comfort. And yet we're seeing right from the beginning of Luke that an angelic visitation brings a certain amount of fear. Zechariah in verse 12 felt fear. Mary felt fear. Um, now all their neighbors are feeling fear from seeing this. So this type of fear is a deep reverence and a, and a true perspective of humility based on being in the presence of something, a being so perfect and so in touch with God's holiness, right? So it's not a fear like, you know, God doesn't want us to be afraid to go to him. What it is, is a right understanding, a fear of like, wow, I can now see my position in the universe. And I can see that there's so much, something so much greater, so much holier, so much more perfect than I am. And it is God. And here are these angelic beings who stand in his presence and they bring out this reverence and awe in me. The Bible says in other places that if we meet them, we're tempted to worship angels. They're so holy and we get a sense of our imperfection so that it leads to this moment of incredible awe and reverence. Uh, we'll see Peter, this happened with Peter uh, during a fishing expedition with Jesus. But it's this overwhelming sense of like, wow, I now get it. I am not worthy. And that's really what that fear is, that moment of like, I am not worthy. I am in the presence of something so much greater and so much worthier than I am. And it, and so it's interesting to me that I sort of our concept of like, if, if we were suddenly in the presence of an angel, that we would have this incredible peace. And yet that's not the experience that we see happening here. Um, so it's just, it's just something to note. So Zechariah's prophecy, now his mouth is opened and we have his words. Um, this, this guy's been, here's a priest who's used to sharing his thoughts, who's used to, you know, like I went on a silent retreat last weekend. You can probably tell because I'm like ready to talk now. And it's, a, it's an interesting thing when someone who I, you know, I make my life, my, my day job is about talking, my speaking and writing is all about words, all about me talking, sharing my thoughts, and then to have a weekend of silence 
it was very powerful and ministering to me. It was a kind of rest I didn't realize that I needed. I'm sure the people around me were happy for the rest. Um, but it, it made me appreciate silence and and just listening to God and hearing from him. And it made me appreciate what Zachariah, he certainly had months and months of it. So he's had time to just be silent and to just have to have time to process before he speaks. And so here it says again, his, his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm trying to remember, and some of you know this better than I do, but this was a time. This was not a time yet where the church had been born. So the Holy Spirit was not generally just available to anyone. So it's poured out on Zechariah here in this verse, these verses. And he prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. Wow. He has visited and redeemed his people. I want you to think about this redemption. Um, well, the first thing I want you to think about is that while we see the equality that is inherent in Christ by Mary and Elizabeth being filled with the Holy Spirit, we don't see Zechariah left out of this, right? Zechariah was a religious leader. He was a priest. He was a male. He's not left out of this. This is not an equality that shuts some people out and raises up people who haven't been in. This is an equality in Christ that raises us all up to what we were designed to be. So here we have Zechariah is filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he speaks of redemption. So right here, even in the birth of John the Baptist, God is prefacing what he's about to do in redeeming his people. Um, redemption is deliverance from the penalty of sin. And here we have it discussed. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a, a horn of salvation for us in the house of the serv of his servant, David. Which, you know, we always, some of you have been studying the Bible forever, so you know, but some of you don't, that, you know, horns of an animal, what are they used for? They're used for defense. They're a symbol of strength and protection that that this is what they use i just saw a camera a picture this week of a deer with a great big um you know i don't know like a huge rack of antlers and the question was you know what are what are the antlers for well they're for defense they are for protection so the horn of salvation is something for our defense for our for our protection for our deliverance and for us in the house of his servant David, verse 70 says, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. So this, in this time, they might have been thinking of their enemies as the Romans. They might have been thinking tribally. But if we broaden that, that we are to be saved from the hand of all who hate us, that means that we are to be saved from the evil one, from, from Satan who hates us. And part of the reason he hates us, like the majority of the reason he hates us, is because God loves us. Right? Satan is the enemy of God, rejects God, wanted to be God, is in no way in equal power to God. Not at all. But he was because he was a created being, he was an angel who was thrown from heaven along with a third of the angels. And he is... Um, and he has fallen and he's fallen and God has not created a path for him to be redeemed. And Satan is integral in tripping up humanity into our fallen state. And yet God here, God is announcing that he has set up a plan of redemption for us. So we don't have to fear because again, God is showing mercy um, on us that he should be, we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. So where our natural response to being in the presence of God or even in the presence of an angelic being is this holy fear because we see our imperfection, our unrighteousness, next to this holiness and completeness. In Christ, we are going to receive, we have received holiness and righteousness that is from Jesus so that we do not have to live in that fear. That's so powerful, right? We can operate from a place of Christ-centered confidence and courage. We do not have to fear in Christ. 
And Zechariah goes on and says, and you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, speaking to John, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins, because, again, of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Wow, right? He gives light to those who sit in darkness. And don't we feel like we live in dark times? We certainly live in dark times. We are frustrated with a lot of the darkness that is around us. We live with this pandemic now, especially we live in the shadow of death. And we long for peace. That path for peace lies through the cross of Jesus Christ. And he, John the Baptist, is there to guide our feet into the way of peace, which is Jesus. And it says, And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. Um, that's, I, I just wanted to share the power of that, um, the redemption that we have in Christ. And that right from the, the earliest pages of the gospel, Luke helps us to see that this plan of redemption is unfolding and taking place and that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit all of these people would have known the same Old Testament scriptures that we know they would have heard them and studied them and worshiped through them and waited for it and now here it is and we get to live on the other side of the cross which is powerful and beautiful for us we are blessed because we get to be born into a time which God chose for us on the other side of the cross where we can receive Forgiveness through Christ, where we can receive his Holy Spirit, which we take for granted too often, because there's power in that Holy Spirit to live without fear, despite the fact that we in ourselves are unrighteous and unholy, but we have a righteousness and holiness now given to us um, by Jesus Christ. Powerful stuff. And um, I love looking at this because I've heard these scriptures so many times. Every Christmas I hear the scripture. And yet, if I look at it and really meditate on it, God just brings, makes all things new, right? And brings new understanding and greater understanding of how this should apply to my life. For me, how this applies to me right now is that I need to keep drawing close to God, closer to God than I draw to the news and to commentary about the news and to fretting and worrying about all that's going on in the world. I need to focus on Jesus and what he did, what he accomplished while he was here and while he was on the cross and what he continues to accomplish um, by the power of his Holy Spirit through those of us who belong to the church. That's where my focus needs to be. That's where my mind and my heart need to live. And when I do, then just like this young child, Mary, was emboldened with the gospel, so we too will find courage and confidence that's centered in Christ, and we too will be bold for the Lord. And our certainty will be a benefit to those who don't know him because it will continue to draw them to him. So loved chatting with you. Hope you'll join me again next uh, Wednesday when we'll start chapter two. Like it only took us four weeks to get to chapter two. But uh, thank you so much for visiting. Let me just pray for us now. Lord God, we do pray for your tender mercy on our nation, on our households, on our churches, on our church leaders, on every believer, Lord. Pray, Lord, that these times would not harden us or discourage us or cause us to lose heart, but rather we would put on the breastplate of righteousness that is ours in Christ, that we could protect our hearts by the, in the name of Jesus, and that we would be bold uh, to be filled with your Holy Spirit and to continue to be witnesses to you, even in times that are just divisive and discouraging and uh, that have the shadow of death. Lord, you have the final word on our lives. You are light that uh, shines in this darkness, and um, the darkness cannot overcome the light of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thanks for stopping by. I will see you next Wednesday, Lord willing.